All right, thank you, Ivan, and uh, to the rest of the organizers as well. I'm very happy to be able to be here and give a talk. It's a great, great conference. Um, so I'll talk about some recent joint work with Dong Wong, who is here, um, on a model that can be thought of as uh, a one-dimensional model of, of fermions, but also as a, um, a finite temperature version of the GUE, the Gaussian Unitary Ensemble. So let's see if this will work. Turn it on. OK. Ah, I see. There you go. Thanks. Um, so because it's a finite temperature version of the GUE, uh, I will first introduce the GUE. Since we're on day five of a random matrices conference, it's maybe not necessary. But uh, okay, this is the Gaussian unitary ensemble of Hermitian matrices. Um, so it can be uh, written as a uh, measure on Hermitian matrices uh, with, uh, OK, there's a flat measure on the entries of the matrix and a, um, a Gaussian term involving the trace of the square of the matrix. So that's probably familiar to most people. Uh, and of course, it's the unitary uh, means that this ensemble is invariant under unitary conjugation. And uh, we know that we can uh, separate eigenvalues from eigenvectors and, and integrate out the ve eigenvectors, and we end up with a nice density on the eigenvalues, which is given here. We've seen it in several talks this week already. Um, and uh, this GUE and, and related uh, models of uh, complex matrices, complex random matrices, have this nice structure of being a determinantal point process, which, uh, which means all of the correlation functions can be written uh, as the determinant of some matrix whose entries are given by a kernel function. And in the case of the GUE, the kernel function uh, is this. It's the Christoffel Darboux kernel uh, for the Hermite polynomials, so the classical Hermite polynomials. Um, OK, and there's the definition of the Hermite polynomials. So, um, so these are orthogonal polynomials with respect to the Gaussian weight. And these are well-known things. Uh, the one-point function is the, the global density of eigenvalues. Uh, it has a limit as n goes to infinity which is given by the semicircle law. Uh, locally, if we take local scaling limits in the bulk, then this uh, Christoffel Darboux kernel converges to the sine kernel in the bulk. Or if we take a slightly different scaling uh, at the edge, it converges to the airy kernel, which is, involves the, the airy functions. And okay, also, the, uh, if we are interested in the largest uh, eigenvalue, then if we scale properly, we get the, the tracy Widom GUE distribution, which is just a Fredholm determinant uh, involving this, this uh, the inter integral operator uh, given by this kernel. OK, so uh, why is this interesting? Uh, well, for 50, six, uh, maybe 60 years, I guess, we've seen uh, that the random matrix type statistics are showing up in um, many different models of highly correlated statistical systems. So here's are some examples. Uh, fermionic particles at low temperature. Uh, we see uh, things showing up in combinatorics and conformal field theory, namely in, in tiling problems. Um, in electrical engineering, uh, if you look at the exit times for uh, for customers in, in queues. Those are given by random matrix statistics in certain uh, cases. Uh, the arrival times of buses in a certain city in Mexico. Uh, and even in analytic number theory, the famous uh, Montgomery con conjecture uh, about the distribution of non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So those show up a lot uh, in correlated systems. Now, in uncorrelated system, we expect to see uh, Poisson-type statistics or independent variables. And there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of work in the past maybe 
10 or 15 years about trying to understand transitions between these, these two types of uh, statistics, random matrix type statistics in which uh, particles tend to repel each other, and Poisson type statistics where things are uh, independent. So this is just a little cartoon of, uh, on the left, we see okay, more regular particles, which is typical of random matrix statistics, and on the right we see uh, some things that are bunched together and big gaps, which is typical of, of independent particles. So, so what about in the middle? What's going on there? So, okay, lots of people have, have tried to approach this question in different ways. Um, so here's some examples of, of models and uh, even um, things observed in, in real life, which are, are seeming to demonstrate uh, this interpolation between a random matrix and Poisson statistics. So, uh, one example is uh, random banded matrices. So certainly if you have a, a diagonal matrix and you look at the spectrum of that and all the entries are independent, then the spectrum is independent. Uh, but if you have a full matrix, then you'll see random matrix statistics for the eigenvalues. So there should be trans some transition between the two. Uh, I had a, f a few names written after this, but I took them off because I can't possibly include everybody. Uh, so I'm sure many people in this room uh, have, have worked on this type of problem. Um, uh, related model is uh, random Schrodinger operators. Those should also exhibit the uh, similar transition. Um, another example is uh, thinned matrix models. So if you take, say, the eigenvalues of a random matrix and you just throw out uh, independently each of them with probability uh, p, then uh, if p gets to be pretty close to one, then you're throwing out a lot of them and the correlation between them will disappear and you'll, you'll get some kind of uh, uncorrelated system. So if you take this p to approach one, then you should see some transition there. And okay, that, uh, as far as I know, started with uh, Bohigas and Pato in the early 2000s probably. Um, and then more recently, Okay, I'm still gonna miss names, but at least I'll include some people in the room. Uh, Butner, Deift, It's Krasovsky, Butner, Buckingham, and, and others have, have, have been working on this type of problem. Uh, here's a, another example which is very recent. It's not a model, it's just a, um, some observation of uh, Trogdon and Jagannath, they looked at the uh, arrival times of trains on the MTA in, in New York City on the subway system. And they noticed sometimes the, the trains arrive similar to random matrix statistics, sometimes it's uh, more Poissonian, and they have some kind of guess as to, as to what separates the two. So that's uh, very interesting. And, and finally, uh, the subject of this talk is uh, models of free fermions at finite temperature. So um, I'll talk much more about uh, all of these works, uh, but about, well, in 1994, there was a, a paper of Moshe Neuberger and Shapiro in which they relate the free fermion model to a random matrix model. Um, and for a certain version of that model, uh, Johansson studied all of the local statistics asymptotically about 10 years ago. And then very recently, um, this group of uh, physicists in France, at least two of whom are here, uh, have, been, have been looking at this model. So I will probably uh, have their names up again, and it'll say DDMS. So, so they've been doing really good work um, in this direction. So let me define this, this model of free fermions at finite temperature. Uh, so it's, it's defined, uh, okay, from quantum mechanics originally. So, um, so here is the, uh, the Hamiltonian of, uh, of a quantum particle in, uh, in a quadratic potential. And we'll fix some of these parameters so that the Hamiltonian becomes very simple. And in this case, uh, the, the eigenvalues, or sorry, the eigenfunctions uh, for the Hamiltonian are exactly uh, these Hermite functions, which we saw uh, back in the GUE. Okay. 
And we're going to consider not just one particle, but uh, n particles. So let's say I have n identical fermions, uh, and they all are in this uh, harmonic potential. And OK, so I have all of these uh, eigenstates, and the uh, eigenstates are indexed by uh, okay, k1, k2, through kn. And these are integers. So I think I had it on the last slide. Oh, maybe I didn't. Sorry. The, uh, so the eigenvalues corresponding to these eigenfunctions are just integers plus a half. So each of these k's tells me what uh, energy level corresponds to each of the uh, particles. And the sum is the total energy. So, uh, so for a fixed energy given by the sum of the k's plus n over 2, then the uh, corresponding eigenfunction is given by the Slater determinant, which is here. So in particular, um, this is the, uh, the wave function. If I want to know about the, um, the probability density for these particles, it's given by the square of the wave function. Um, so in particular, if uh, k1 is 1 and k2 is 2, et cetera, these are just the first n integers, then this is exactly uh, the square is exactly the uh, density for the GUE. So the, the ground state for this uh, free fermion model is exactly the, the GUE. Um, OK, so but I want to consider uh, you know, that any, any eigenstate is possible. So uh, typically, the probability for a, a certain eigenstate is given by exponential of uh, minus energy divided by temperature. And there's probably a constant missing there, but the constant I said equal to 1. Um, and so if I just write q equal minus e to the minus 1 over t for temperature, then I can write the, uh, the probability density for the free fermion model as a sum over all eigenstates of the Slater determinant squared uh, weighted by q to the total energy. So that's. That's the model we're looking at. Um, and I think that's all of the quantum mechanics that I know. So now I just will s stick with this density function. And that's what I'll work with. Um, OK, so that's the model of free fermions. Now, um, I mentioned that Moshe Neuberger and Shapiro related this model to a random matrix model. And so to describe the, uh, the matrix model, which we call the MNS matrix model, uh, we can just write a formula for the, for the probability measure on Hermitian matrices given by this. So, uh, okay, there's a normalizing constant. This looks exactly like the GUE. And then uh, there's another term here which takes my Hermitian matrix H and uh, integrates, okay, it hits H with a unitary matrix U take exponent, trace, and integrate over all the unitary matrices. So this kind of smears H out a little bit. Um, and we integrate over the, the Haar measure on unitary matrices. And OK, if we look at this formula, there's a parameter B here. And it's clear if B is equal to 0, then this whole uh, term disappears. It's just a constant. And this is exactly the GUE. Um, on the other hand, what happens when b approaches infinity? What happens when b gets big? Well, it's not that obvious, I don't think, from this formulation. But uh, this integral, actually, you can, you can do the integration exactly. This is the uh, harsh chandra itzik and zubir integral. So you can do the integration. You can, again, separate eigenvalues from eigenvectors. And you can write a very nice formula for the uh, density of eigenvalues. And here is. OK, here's a product of independent Gaussians. And then the interaction, instead of a, a Vandermann type interaction, you get uh, okay, exponent of minus b to the power difference of the, of the x's. So, OK, so now I can see what happens when b goes to infinity. Because if b goes to infinity, then, uh, then this entries of the matrix here become just a delta function on uh, xi equal xj. So it just becomes a diagonal matrix. In other words, the particles become independent. Okay. So, um, so b goes to infinity, we get independent particles. b goes to 0, we get GUE.
Okay, so, uh, so this is a very natural model uh, to study uh, the, the transition from random matrix statistics to, to Poisson statistics. Uh, okay, here's one more model, <laughs> which is also natural. Um, so consider uh, N Brownian bridges. So that means uh, I take Brownian motions, which are conditioned to start and end at the same points, and let's call the starting and ending points x1 through xn, and I'll, I'll let them evolve over time t. Okay? And I'll also take the starting and ending points to be uh, just independent Gaussian random variables. Okay, so I just take n independent Gaussians, and that's where I start my Brownian bridges. Um, and then furthermore, I condition, uh, yeah, somewhere I said that, I condition that they don't intersect over the whole time t. Okay, okay and now I consider the distribution of the starting points after the conditioning that they don't intersect. Okay, so if I took my sample of independent Gaussians and these points were, or any two of these points were really close together, then, okay, it's kind of likely they'll intersect. And so then we start over and we, uh, we try again, okay? Uh, so if T is small, then, okay, then it's unlikely that the particles will ever intersect. You know, they're not gonna be right on top of each other. So for small T, um, these starting points are, are basically uh, independent of one another. But if t gets big, then, okay, if we sample the x's and they're too close together, then they have a good chance to intersect over the time t. Um, and so after I condition on the non intersecting, these starting points really start to repel each other. It becomes more likely they're farther apart. Um, and in that case, we get uh, random matrix statistics. So this total time t also uh, is going to somehow interpolate between Poisson and random matrix statistics in this model. Uh, so this is the fact that was noticed by Johansson 10 years ago or so. Uh, the distribution of these starting points for these non-intersecting Brownian bridges is exactly the same as the MNS model with just a simple relation between the B in the MNS model and the T, the total time, um, in these non-intersecting Brownian bridges. Uh, and also, this is a fact that was noticed by uh, Moshe Neubiger and Shapiro. Uh, the MNS mo model is equivalent to the free fermion at finite temperature model in the quadratic well. Um, so remember, Q was e to the minus one over temperature. So if we take uh, B to be just a simple function of that Q, uh, then we get exactly the same density of particles. So, uh, so we can really think about this as a, as a random matrix model or a uh, model of free fermions. They're exactly the same. I like to think about random matrices. So, so from now on, I think I'll be talking about the MNS matrix model. Um, so uh, what can you do uh, in terms of analysis of this, of this model? Well, um, unlike, random matri unlike the GUE, uh, the MNS model is not determinantal. It's a little more complicated. However, if we take uh, a grand canonical version of the MNS model, then we do have something which is, uh, which is determinantal. So um, I think Johansson calls this a deformed GUE in, in some of his papers. Uh, so the idea is instead of taking a matrix of fixed size or the number of particles to be fixed, we let the number of particles be random with a certain distribution, which is given here. It's like a Poisson distribution. Um, then we end up with something that is determinantal. And the correlation kernel, instead of being a finite sum of, uh, of the Hermite functions, it's given by an infinite weighted sum of the Hermite functions. And there's a lambda here, which is, uh, which is controlling kind of the average number of particles in the ensemble. Okay. So, um, so what Johansson did about 10 years ago was to, uh, to look at this grand canonical version and uh, take asymptotics as uh, lambda goes to infinity in an appropriate way. So the average number of particles is going to infinity. And he found local statistics, uh, which I'll describe, well, I'll describe in a moment, okay. So the, the results of Johansson are 
exactly the same as, as the results that, that Dong and I found um, and that uh, uh, DDMS, uh, Dean, Ledusal, Majumdar, and Cher found uh, for, the, for the canonical ensemble, that is, when the number of particles is fixed. So, so let me talk a little bit about the can canonical ensemble, and then I'll, I'll tell the results for the local statistics. Um, so as we said, the, the MNS model, if the number of particles is fixed, is not a determinantal point process. Um, however, uh, it's related to one. So the st statistics can still be described using determinants. Uh, it's just uh, not directly. So here's a formula for the uh, gap probability for the canonical version of the MNS model, where the number of particles is exactly n. Uh, so I wrote P sub n, just uh, that n stands for the total number of particles in the system. So, um, so if I want to know, if I pick a measurable set on the real line, and I want to know the probability that there's no particles at all in that set, that's the, the gap probability. And I can write it, here's a Fredholm determinant, uh, 1 minus sum operator k times the, uh, times the indicator function on the set A. So that's what we would usually see uh, in, in GUE-type models for the gap probability. But now I have to take, it depends on a parameter z, I have to integrate against some given function over z, uh, just over a, a circle around, the, around zero in the complex plane. Okay, so, so there's a determinant, but uh, I can't work directly with the determinant, I have to first integrate. And here's the formula for the, for the operator k. So you'll notice uh, it's, this is exactly the same as the, uh, the kernel which shows up in the grand, can, grand canonical ensemble, just with uh, lambda replaced by z. So somehow I'm taking that lambda and I'm integrating over some, some uh, contour in the complex plane. Okay, okay so that's uh, a nice exact formula. Um, for the gap probability, what about uh, correlation functions? Well, it's very similar. Uh, so uh, Dong and I found this formula, and then we noticed that <laughs> six months before, uh, DDMS had the same formula in their paper, which we somehow missed. So, so this, is, uh, this was their result first, I guess. Um, but uh, it's, it's exactly the same. The, the correlation function for uh, for a determinantal point process would just be the determinant of uh, some kernel function. And I take exactly that, and then I have to integrate over actually the same, I, I have to multiply by the same function, and then integrate over a, uh, the same contour in the complex plane. Um, so those are very nice formulas, which, which really reminded us of um, some formulas we saw in well, in a lot of work in the past 10 years, but uh, maybe first that I saw in the paper of Borodin and Corwin uh, on McDonald processes, this big paper. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to come back to, to that connection uh, at the end of the talk. But before I do, um, let me talk a little bit about uh, trying, to do, trying to use these formulas for asymptotic analysis. So, so these are exact n formulas, and then we want to take some limits as n goes to infinity. Um, now, okay, it doesn't look too bad. The, the main difficulty is that um, I'm going to want to scale temperature to go to infinity. If temperature is fixed, then um, basically the, the asymptotic statistics should be the same as, as GUE. So I'm going to scale uh, the temperature close to infinity, which means I scale Q close to 1. And when Q gets close to 1, this kernel... Uh, has a singularity on the, on the negative real axis. And as Q gets close to 1, these singularities are accumulating. So we can't really avoid getting close to, uh, to the singularity, which means somehow we have to control this, this determinant carefully. It's not so bad, but you just have to be careful. Um, so what are the results? Uh, so as we said, uh, if Q is fixed, that is, if temperature is fixed, then um, I can ask about 
global density of particles. And if Q is fixed, then the global density of particles converges to a semicircle after rescaling. Um, and what if Q is getting close to one? So if I scale Q so it, that it is um, of distance one over n, roughly, from one. So I can write Q is e to the minus some constant divided by n. Then, um, OK, then we have a different uh, global density. It's given by oh, this, this, uh, this is the poly logarithm function, which, OK, some special function. You can look on Wikipedia to see what it is. Um, but you can also just look at these pictures. It's better. So uh, for a finite C, the, um, this density is, is supported on the whole real line. So it's not supported on a compact set anymore. But I plotted for, I think this is C equals 1 tenth, C equals 1, C equals 100, C equals 1,000. Um, and you can see this is getting closer and closer to the semicircle. Um, OK, those are global asymptotics. Now what about uh, local asymptotics? So, um, so the local asymptotics are given by uh, determinantal processes in the, in the limit. So this, for the grand canonical ensemble, this result was obtained by Johansson. Um, and uh, for the canonical ensemble, DDMS uh, last year, and then uh, Dong and I uh, very recently, we're able to do this asymptotics. So, um, so again, if Q is fixed, if temperature is fixed, then um, if I ask what the location of the largest particle is, well, it's governed by the by the GUE uh, Tracy Whittem distribution. That's not too surprising. Um, and if Q is getting close to one, now since I'm looking at the edge here, I use a slightly different scaling. Uh, I want the Q to be of order n to the minus one third from one. So I use the scaling e to the minus c times n to the minus one third. So I still have a, a scaling parameter c here. And I ask what's the distribution of the largest particle? Well, it converges to uh, some distribution called F cross. Um, and F cross is the Fredholm determinant, again, of uh, of some other kernel, which is given here. So it's an integral, uh, airy times airy, and then this explicit prefactor. So, um, right, so if, if this explicit prefactor wasn't here and we integrated uh, from zero, that would be exactly the, the airy, uh, the airy kernel. So, So this uh, distribution has appeared in several places before, um, namely uh, in the weak coupling regime for the, for the KPZ equation uh, in this paper of Amir Corwin and Quastel. Um, and so there's, yeah, that's the first connection, I guess, with, with KPZ theory. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, it also appeared earlier in, in Johansson's analysis of this grand canonical version of this model, and, uh, and in the DDMS uh, analysis of the canonical version. Um, so this is what, uh, so Johansson looked close at, you know, I guess this uh, kernel first appeared in the paper of Johansson, so he looked closely at it, and he found, uh, okay, certainly if you take C to infinity, this converges to GUE. That's very easy to see. Um, and it's just a little bit more calculation to say, see that when C goes to zero uh, and you rescale properly, then this converges to the Gumbel distribution. Um, so the Gumbel distribution is uh, extreme, extreme statistics uh, distribution associated with, with Gaussian random variables. And so it's not surprising. Uh, I'm looking at the, the maximum uh, particle, the biggest particle. And if the particles become independent, then I expect to see the Gumbel distribution. Um, OK, so that was asymptotics at the edge, the, um, the distribution of the largest particle. What if I go into the bulk and I ask for uh, the local statistics in the bulk? So once again, 
In the limit, I get a determinantal point process, uh, which is not too surprising since the grand canonical version is determinantal. Uh, we expect the canonical version to agree in the, in the large n limit. So, um, okay, so this is the result. Uh, if Q is fixed once again, uh, and I look at the correlation kernel in the bulk, then I get exactly the correlation kernel for the sign process. Not, uh, again, not surprising. Um, and if I scale Q, so now I'm back to scaling uh, Q as e to the minus c over n, since I'm in the bulk. And so now, if I take a scaling in the bulk uh, with Q depending on n in that way, and I take uh, a limit of the correlation function, I get a determinant again, so I still get a determinantal point process. Uh, and the kernel is written here. Um, so the definition here of k inter, interpolating, um, it depends on a parameter a. And here's a, it's in the denominator uh, of the integrand. Now, in my formula for the uh, correlation function, I'm plugging in a equal c times x, uh, sorry, e to the c times x squared divided by e to the c minus 1. So, um, so this kernel depends on c, certainly, but it also depends on x. x is uh, the point in the bulk at which I've, I've uh, scaled, at which I've, uh, I've zoomed in. Um, so this was a little bit surprising to us, because usually this is, this is actually a random matrix model. It's an MNS random matrix model. Um, and we expect to see universality in the, in the local statistics. And so there's a universal form, of course, but the kernel, the, the local kernel, does depend exactly on where you've, you've zoomed in. Um, so you can see this does interpolate between uh, a sign kernel and a Poisson process. Um, in Johansson's earlier work on the ground crane canonical ensemble, he only considered uh, x equals 0, so zooming in close to the origin. Uh, so yeah, this is what I just said. The limiting kernel depends on the location x. Um, then we looked, uh, well, we didn't look. We, <laughs> we, uh, it was pointed out to us by Gregory Scher that um, actually they had found something similar, uh, the D DDMS group. Um, but they were actually looking at a much more general model in higher dimension, or general dimension and general potential. So uh, we didn't quite. Uh, catch that, we didn't translate uh, to see that they had found something similar, this uh, location dependence, or um, yeah, in their case, it's actually potential dependent. So I can um, give a, a quick sketch of the proof of our formula for the, for the gap probability um, that's maybe instructive um, as to how this stuff works. So, so if I'm interested in the gap probability, I want to know the probability that uh, all n particles are in some set, A. OK, so I can just write that 